Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Cox. Uh, I'm called the chair of LSC. I'm not sure that's entirely right. <laughs> Have I just taken the director's job? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm one of the co-directors or founding co-director of LSC Ideas, which I put together many years ago with my good friend uh, Arnie Westad, who's in the audience. Today we've been having a conference on American structural power. We started with Jim O'Neill and we ended with Barry Bazan. That's not bad for the day. We had a fantastic conference just talking about the questions of American structural power and what it means both economically, militarily, politically and institutionally. And I couldn't think of anybody better to, in a sense, conclude the day's uh, proceedings than, uh, than Joe Nye. Uh, Joe, they say, is a living legend, and that's what you are, Joe. A legend who's still alive. Barely, barely. Uh, and, and, and if you can keep both together for a few more years, you know, we, we, we are doing jolly well. Sometimes named the third most influential, the sixth most influential, and the tenth most influential IR scholar in the world. That's not bad going. There are reasons for that, because Joe has engaged with so many issues over such a long period of time, so intelligently, and so effectively, and with such great communication skills. He, with Bob Cohane in the 1970s, navigated the whole argument about interdependence and complex interdependence in, in, those interesting, in that interesting decade called the 1970s, uh, which some of us can remember well, but most of you can't because you weren't around. Um, he wrote a book on Bound to Lead on the question of American decline. And then Joe Guy got into power in a big way, uh, soft power, which was a term he coined in 2004. And this is one of these academic ideas which was taken off, and I think most of you have probably heard of it, which was one of the reasons you're all here this evening. Soft power, smart power, what kind of power? The power game, the power to lead, the power of the future. Joe has done it all in his comeback. He's a great communicator. And we're really looking forward to what he has. An old friend of the LSC and a very old friend of mine, it's very nice to say. Global power and a shifting international order, the West and the rest. Nobody better to talk on that than Professor Joe Nye of Harvard University. Welcome once again to the London School of Economics, Joe. Thank you very much, Mick, for that kind, overly kind introduction. I must say that uh, uh, I should warn you that uh, when people would call my uh, house when my children were growing up, and they'd say, is Dr. Nye there? The children would always say, yes, but he's not the useful kind. So, <laughs> so caveat, uh, Evdor. Uh, Mick has asked me to uh, say something about global power and shifting international order and the rest and the West. And there are many people in this audience I see here who know as much or more about that than I. But let me give you some thoughts and then we can have some time with our Q&As to actually converse about it or have different views about it. Let me first start by defining terms. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but for me, power is the ability to affect others to get the outcomes you want. So if you think of power in that sense, as that definition, then there are basically three ways you can affect others to get the outcomes you want. You can do it through coercion, through payment, or through attraction and persuasion. And uh, in that sense, uh, we need to think of power in all these ways. Uh, certainly, when I was studying power at Oxford, uh, or studying international relations years ago, maybe ancient history, as Mick says, um, uh, I remember listening to A.J.P. Taylor of his marvelous lectures. And for Taylor, a power, uh, and power itself, was the ability to prevail in war. And I think uh, that's still relevant, but it's not all of what power is or what, uh, what matters. So if you think back to uh, the question of Taylor addressed in his classic book, The Struggle for Mastery of Europe, uh, a great power was a country which was more likely to prevail in a European war uh, but many people have said that uh, in today's age, the information age, 
Sometimes it's more important whose story wins than whose army wins. And perhaps that ability, both having a winning army and a winning story, or the fact successful narrative, is the secret of power. But in any case, with that definitional background, let me say that as we look at what's happening in the, power, in the world today, there really are, as I argued in my book, The Future of Power, two big shifts going on, one of which is a shift, if you want, that uh, you can think of it as horizontal from one set of states to another set of states. And this is sometimes called the rise of the rest, which we're going to focus on. But equally important, and I'll come to this later in my talk, there's a second power shift going on from state to non-state actors, or you can think of that as a vertical shift. And in some ways, that's more complex, more difficult to understand than the first shift, uh, the horizontal shift. And uh, at the end of my talk, I'll try to relate those two types of shifts and indicate what that suggests for uh, the future of power. Now, what does IR theory tell us about uh, uh, the rise of the rest or power transitions? Well, before I answer that question, let me just say that it's very much conventional to talk about the power of the bricks. And in that same definitional sense, let me say, I think with all deference to Jim O'Neill for inventing a term which was very good for investors who wanted to make money in stock markets, as a political concept, the BRICS is really not a very useful concept. The reason it's not useful is because it takes a declining power, Russia, and combines it with rising powers, which are the others. And it leaves out some other rising powers, like Indonesia and, and so forth. So I don't think as it, 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 it is also fascinating to see that, that, uh, that the Russians uh, latched onto the concept. It's a clever acronym. Uh, to start the first meeting of BRIC countries in Yekaterinburg, and I guess it was 2009. So it's useful for that sort of diplomatic purposes. But if we're really trying to talk analytically about uh, changes in the world, I think the term BRIC uh, is not a useful concept for the way we do it, though it's now widely used. And basically it, it involves countries, some of which are our pluralistic uh, democracies, Britain, uh, Brazil and India, uh, South Africa, uh, with countries which are relatively autocratic, China and Russia. But even more important, I think, is that these countries have deep internal differences. And the Russian case really is different. Russia, and this is not an anti-Russian comment, because I hope it's not true. Uh, I mean, I hope they will do something to make what I say now a self-fulfilling fallacy. But um, Russia is a country which is basically a one-crop economy with a serious demographic problem and a terrible health problem. The average Russian male dies at age 60. There's no other developed country in the world where that's true. Now, there are, in principle, solutions to that. and. When Medvedev was president, he suggested some, but they were in, unable to actually implement them. So I think Russia is a, is a country which has very serious problems. I hope they can cure them, but to lump them together with, let's say, China and India and so forth, just in Brazil, that just is not analytically what we need. The, uh, the other thing, of course, about the BRICS is that most of it's really about China. I mean, if you take the economics, more than half of it is China. And China is an extraordinary case. I mean, the Chinese in three decades have raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and done an extraordinary job of increasing the scale of their economy overall. Uh, so that's why you don't want an analytical concept that lumps Russia with the problems it has with China and calling it something called BRICS. Anyway, enough of, the, of my definitions of power and the rest not being bricks and so forth. So the main thing I think we need to focus on for IR theory is what does it mean when you have a transition of the type that we're seeing now, this horizontal shift of power that I've talked about, 
And in particularly, let me focus on China as the, I mean, there are many countries that are involved in the transition, but let me focus particularly on China and the role of China and in relationship to the U.S. What tools do we have in IR theory? Well, we often use the term hegemony. And we have two versions of theories of hegemony. One is hegemonic transition theory. The other is hegemonic stability theory. Well, in hegemonic transition theory, I suppose you could cite Robert Gilpin's work as a, as a good example of this, it harkens back to Thucydides in the famous Thucydidean explanation of the origins of the Peloponnesian War. It was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta. And there has been a tendency to say that when you have a hegemonic transition of this sort, where a rising power creates fear in an established power, it's likely to lead to conflict. And uh, to give you an example, I mean, people often cite World War I, the rising power of Germany and the fear it created in Britain, which is actually a rather oversimplified view of the origins of World War I, but it's often used by editorialists and others. Uh, but if you look at the current world, there are a number of people who say that the rising power of China will create fear in the U.S., which will lead to conflict. And um, I suppose that um, among our colleagues who think about this, uh, John Mearsheimer would be closest to somebody who has expressed this. As, as usual, John <coughs> expresses things extremely clearly. Whether they're <laughs> right or wrong, they're, he's always clear. <coughs> and John has said, and his words, is that China cannot rise peacefully. Um, so there's a prediction there. It's fairly clear. And it's based on, if you want, hegemonic transition theory of the sort that Robert Gilpin outlined 30, 40 years ago. Now, so one tool that we have to understand this global power shift in the West and the rest is hegemonic transition theory. The other is, ironically, the, almost the opposite, hegemonic stability theory. And this is often associated with uh, Charles Kindleberger, the, the famous MIT economist. And basically what Kindleberger said is you need a hegemon, there needs to be a state which can act in the role of hegemon to be able to provide public goods for the world. And when hegemonic transition is contested, when there isn't hegemonic stability, then those public goods will not be provided. And uh, Charlie Kinderberger used to use the example of Britain and the United States. Uh, Britain emerged weakened from World War I, the United States emerged strengthened from World War I. Uh, Britain was no longer able to provide the public goods, free trade, a stable monetary system, and so forth, that uh, it had provided when it uh, was preeminent. But the Americans hadn't grown up. The Americans had, weren't ready to take on that responsibility. So essentially, the great problem with collective goods, as you all know, is, is the free rider problem, why pay for something if you can ride the bus for free? And the Americans were free riders. So in Kindleberger's view, the problems of the 1930s were a problem of hegemonic stability. The absence of a hegemon and the fact the country that had become the most powerful uh, hadn't grown up, so to speak, and uh, wasn't prepared to take this role, uh, led to the conditions of the Great Depression, which of course led to the disastrous political consequences of Hitler and so on and on and on. Story you all know well. So we have this, this tool, um, uh, or these two tools relating to hegemonic uh, transition, hegemonic stability that we use in IR theory. Um, but one of the problems I have with them is it's never quite clear how we define the term. What's a hegemon? Um, my colleague and friend Bob Cohane, if you look at his book, After Hegemony, which basically argued that maybe Kindleberger wasn't completely right, that maybe you could have public goods provided by uh, institutions, um, which I, I happen to agree with, with Cohane on that. But even in his book on After Hegemony, you'll find that at one place in the book he talks about 
a hegemon is a country with preponderant resources. In another place, a hegemon is a country able to maintain the rules. Well, you'd say, well, a country with preponderant resources can maintain <coughs> the rules. But actually, those are quite different definitions. One is a definition in terms of power resources. The other is a definition in terms of power behavior. And those aren't always the same. For example, uh, if you look at the United States and you say, when in the 20th century was the United States most preponderant in power resources, it would probably be 1945 to 1960. That everybody else was weakened by World War II. The U.S. was strengthened. The U.S. had, uh, you know, some people estimate 40 to 50 percent of world product in 1945. Had uh, it was the only country in possession of nuclear weapons and so forth. So clearly, by one measure, power resources, this was the peak of hegemony. In terms of behavior, of setting the rules or getting what you want. The U.S. in that period of this peak behavior couldn't prevent communism coming to China, couldn't prevent Stalin from getting nuclear weapons, couldn't prevent Fidel Castro from coming to power right off our shore. Uh, so here we were at the peak of our hegemonic power by one measure of hegemony, and in terms of behavioral outcomes, we were not doing all that well. It's not as though these were trivial issues. These were major issues. That <coughs> so we have to be very careful when we talk about hegemony to ask whether we're defining it in terms of resources, in terms of behavior, because they're often not exactly the same. The other point is that um, when people make predictions based on these theories, hegemonic stability or hegemonic transition, um, they sometimes neglect the role of human agency or leadership. Um, I've just this week published a, a book which, I, which is uh, called Political Leadership and the Creation of the American Era. And what I did in this book was go back and look at the 20th century and ask the question, did presidents matter? Did leaders matter? So one way to think about it is in the beginning of the 20th century, the United States is a second-rate power. By the end of the 20th century, the United States is the world's only superpower. Some people would say that was inevitable. If you have a continental-scale economy and two oceans and weak neighbors, it's going to happen. It's all structural. If that's true, does it matter then who was president? Maybe presidents don't matter at all. So what I did in this book is go back and look at the periods of expansion of American power in the 20th century and look at the presidents who were crucial in the decisions that they made and then ask if you did a counterfactual history and you said suppose this person wasn't president and the next most likely person was president instead, knowing what their preferences are and what decisions they would make, would the outcome have been any different? So, I mean, if thinking back, you know, William, if uh, McKinley hadn't been assassinated, there would never have been a president, Teddy Roosevelt. The uh, Republican establishment hated Roosevelt. They saw him as a cowboy. If Teddy Roosevelt hadn't run for a third term in 2012, which he had once promised not to do, but did, uh, and split the Republican vote so that William Howard Taft was defeated, uh, and Woodrow Wilson was able to come in as a minority vote president, there never would have been a president Woodrow Wilson. And if Franklin Roosevelt hadn't decided to switch his vice president in 1944 and substitute Harry Truman for Henry Wallace, there never would have been a, Harry, a president Harry Truman, and so forth. So what I do is a counterfactual history and go back through history and, and ask what difference did leaders make? And the conclusion I come up with is about half of the leaders didn't matter, but about <laughs> half did. Half of them made some decisions which were absolutely crucial to the outcomes. And therefore, people who are predicting power shifts in hegemony or preponderance of resources um, on structure alone, which most structural realists like to do, are missing the role of human agency. 
And I think one of the problems that we have in IR is often uh, we get so en enamored of our structural models that we forget that agency matters. And there are some agency decisions which are crucially important. Let me, let me just give you one as an example. Um, in 1955, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States recommended to Dwight Eisenhower that he use nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, whatever that meant, <laughs> against China, because otherwise it would be impossible to defend Kimoy and Matsu, which are just off the coast of China. Eisenhower's comment was, my God, we can't use those things on Asian boys again within 10 years. Quite an extraordinary comment, a moral sentiment, if you want, or a moral choice. Imagine that he, it had, it had not been Eisenhower, but it had been Douglas MacArthur, another World War II mm. hero who had become president instead of Eisenhower, which is not a far-fetched idea because MacArthur wanted to become president. MacArthur would have used <coughs> nuclear weapons. What would the world look like today if instead of a 70-year-old taboo against the use of nuclear weapons, if we'd had nuclear weapons used every 10 years as normal tactical weapons, or fewer than 10 years, it'd be a very different world. That's a case of human agency making a big difference. And just measuring the resources and thinking in structural terms doesn't quite get it. I'm always amused that uh, according to Walter Isaacson in his biography of Henry Kissinger. Um, Kissinger, when he was teaching at Harvard, believed that international relations was structural, <laughs> that that answered it. But after he served in government, he changed his position. <laughs> so where you stand on this question of structure and agency, obviously where you stand depends on where you sit. But I guess my point is that the theories that we use in IR, hegemonic transition, or hegemonic stability, particularly measuring them in terms of, of preponderance of resources in structural terms, really don't capture all we need to know to do a good international relations, theorizing and describing this shifting international order, the West and the rest. So I think we need to be very careful uh, to bring, if you want, the first image back in, the role of individuals, as I said, about half of the presidents mattered, another half didn't. It actually turned out it wasn't the ones that you, or at least that I expected to matter most, but that's, we'll leave that, that's not tonight's topic. But there's also a problem of what narratives you use to explain the context of the shift that's going on. And one of the dominant uh, narratives that's used now is either the decline of the West or the decline of the United States. I mean, declinism is a, is a very powerful metaphor. And, you know, we were brought up on, uh, on Gibbon and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And, uh, you know, you have Paul Kennedy's wonderful work on uh, uh, the rise and fall of the great powers. And so when one looks at this power shift that's going on, the horizontal power shift I described today, it's very tempting to say, well, you know, it's American decline. And so declinism is, a, is a, a trope, a very popular theme, which is used again and again by editorialists or talking heads on TV or even some scholars. And um, I think it's a, it's a rather misleading decline. Um, I think that uh, it, it, it really doesn't help us to understand what's the nature of U.S. power and where the U.S. is in the world today. If you go back to Paul Kennedy's book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which incidentally is the book that I responded to when I wrote Bound to Lead way back in 1990, Paul had the view that um, there was a cycle and that America was in a position in the cycle that was similar to, let's say, Philip II Spain or Edwardian Britain and so forth. And um, he used the term imperial overstretch. And it, 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 it's intuitively uh, satisfying in the sense that it means that as a country expands, as it becomes, in quotes, more hegemonic, whatever that means, 
as it expands, it commits more and more resources to its external position, both military and aid and propping up allies and the rest of this. So as it devotes more and more resources to this, it starves its own domestic economy. And finally, it gets imperially overstretched. Joseph Chamberlain you know, began to worry about this in, in late 19th century Britain. And, and so Paul talks about imperial overstretch. And the argument is the Americans suffering from imperial overstretch. The trouble with that is it's actually quite a good model to explain one of the superpowers, the Soviet Union, but not the other. Let me give you the reason why. The Soviet Union did indeed get to a point where a, nearly a quarter of its gross domestic product was spent on keeping its empire or its military position. That's a huge burden, and in the meantime, the Soviet economy domestically wasn't coping with the so-called third industrial revolution, the development of the information age and information technology. So imperial overstretch is a pretty good explanation of what happened to the Soviet Union. It's not a very good explanation of what happened to the United States. Today, the United States spends about, what, 5% of its gross domestic product on its external burdens, including both military and aid and diplomacy and everything. Um, at the height of the Cold War, the U.S. spent 10 percent. So if imperial overstretch is the model of what's happening to American power, excuse me, the curve's going the wrong direction. The theory and the data don't, don't fit. That doesn't stop people from theorizing, but it does strike me that if we're being analytically careful, we're not going to apply imperial overstretch to what's happening to the United States. And so I think in that sense, the, the, the decline metaphor in that version is not very helpful. It's also not very helpful in the sense that the decline metaphor has a, um, an implied idea of something that's a life cycle, that we can know what is the life cycle of a country or a great power or whatever. Um, we can know the life cycle of an individual human. It's very rare for any of us to live past 120, if then. We usually get count on four score years or three score years and 10. So I can look you in the eye and assure you that I am in decline. <laughs> you can just check my birth date. And be, you can be, it's a very strong proposition. But if you ask me what's the prospect that the United States is in decline because it's gone through some natural life cycle, none of us know. And it's not impossible to know. The great example of this, and I cite this example in the book I did on the future of power, was Horace Walpole in the 18th century who said, woe is Britain after the loss of the North American colonies. We are now reduced to a miserable little island like Sardinia. <laughs> that was on the eve of Britain's greatest century, which was fueled by the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> so we don't know what the life cycle of a country is. And even if we did think we knew, you don't know what the duration of the periods in the cycle are. So that uh, uh, if you look at the Roman Empire, yes, we do know retrospectively about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, but it's worth remembering it took three centuries to go from the apogee to the final collapse. So we don't know where America is in terms of, of a life cycle. So as we use a term like decline, um, we ought to be careful not to let the metaphor shape how we project the future. I mean, even if the Americans decline someday, I don't know, is it next year or is it a century from now? I have no idea. And I don't think most people who write about it do either. Now, one question you can ask is, is America in absolute decline? Is American power in absolute decline? And there uh, you can say, you know, what do we know about certain characteristics? America has a lot of problems, it always has, right from the beginning. But if you look at American economy today, uh, you know, in terms of uh, world's leading universities, number of Nobel prizes, the amount of R&D, 
the, uh, uh, you know, you can go through a whole series of measures about creativity that's going on in the American economy. And if you compare that, let's say, to ancient Rome, which had no productivity and was racked by internecine warfare, there really, it's a very different situation. So a model of absolute decline doesn't strike me as very useful. More interesting would be relative decline, and that's where we come to this rise of the rest. Uh, if you think of this as a situation where the Americans are here, and let, we'll use China for now, but China was here, and as China closes that gap, you can describe that as the rise of the rest, or you can disclose it, or you can describe that narrowing gap as relative decline, even though the American position doesn't change. Suppose it doesn't change. So you, know, you can use terminology of relative decline, or you can use terminology of rise of the rest. I think it's more useful to use the term rise of the rest. And the reason is, even if the rest close the gap with the United States, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll pass. In other words, a closing gap can be seen as relative decline it doesn't necessarily prove surpassing. Now, people can look at me and say, my God, how can you say that when everyone knows that China is going to have a larger economy than the United States within the decade? And the answer is there's too much what I call cheap talk about GDP. Because of a size of GDP, people assume that's the only measure of economic power and that that's the only measure of power. And that's simply not the case. When China's GDP passes the US, and let's assume it's within this decade, uh, it will be, and let's assume you measure it either in purchasing power parity or exchange rates, it doesn't matter too much from the point I'm gonna make. It doesn't mean that China will have an economy equivalent to the US in terms of its sophistication which you might want to measure by per capita income. And when China passes the U.S., its per capita income will be about the level of the U.S. in 1930. So there's a huge gap there. One measure, China will have economic power by the size of its economy. That's a measure of the size of the population. By another measure, though, China will still be quite poor and far less sophisticated as an economy. So just on measuring economic power, the fact that China will have a bigger GDP within, I don't know, you name the number of years you want to choose, doesn't prove that China has more economic power, much less that it has more overall power. Uh, for example, if you look at military power, China is increasing its capacity militarily. It has uh, been increasing its, mili its military budget by about 10% a year or more, and it has a greater capacity than it once had. But the idea that it will have the ability to challenge the United States as a global military power within the next 10, 30 years is not, not very likely. And then if you look at soft power, the third dimension, I've talked about economic power, military power, soft power, the third power, this ability to attract others, China is investing a great deal in increasing its soft power. Indeed, Hu Jintao told the 17th Party Congress in 2007 that China should increase its soft power, and it has been spending billions of dollars on this. Very interesting recent new book by David Shumwall on uh, China as a global uh, power, which uh, has a great chapter showing how China is making these efforts to increase its soft power. But one of the problems with China and soft power is it, there's an uh, unwillingness to realize that a lot of a country's soft power is produced not by government but by civil society. And so long as China closely regulates civil society, it's leashing its capacity to generate soft power. So to give you an example, uh, example I used a speech I gave at uh, Peking University, um, if you look at 2010, when you had the Shanghai Exposition, which was a wonderful exposition, if you, if you ever visited it, was, if, it, it you, you, you couldn't come out of that without appreciating Chinese culture. It was just a, a wonderful thing. What did China do after generating soft power through a successful Olympics and Shanghai Expo? It locked up Liu Xiaobo and let the world see an empty chair on the stage at Oslo. That's called stepping on your own message. 
in the advertising world. But in other words, until China is able to unleash civil society, and that's going to be very difficult to do so long as the nature of control by the Communist Party remains as it is, China is not going to be able to equal the U.S. in soft power. Just being able to generate a lot of broadcast by the government is not the form of way you get credibility that you need for soft power. So if we go back to the basic argument, which is because China's GDP is going to be bigger than the U.S., China has passed the U.S. Excuse me, no. On one measure, if you want to call it GDPism, uh, China will be bigger than the U.S. But on per capita GDP, another measure of economic power, on military power and on soft power, no, China won't catch up with the U.S. for quite some long time. And just in case you doubt my word for it, I did have an occasion in the last year to meet with the Prime Minister of China, and his comment is it's going to take us at least 30 years to catch up with the United States. But in any case, this is not to argue that China hasn't done an extraordinary job. It has, as I said earlier. It's to argue that the people who then use this rise of China and the idea that China is passing the U.S. to predict a hegemonic transition which will be violent I think are mistaken. Basically, if China were like Germany, challenging Britain in 1914, then it might generate a degree of fear, which could lead to the type of cycle that Thucydides originally described. But if China, in fact, is going to be quite behind the US as a matter of decades, then there's no reason for the Americans to be so fearful. We don't have to overreact. When Britain was trying to understand what was happening with German foreign policy, Germany had already passed Britain by 1900 in manufacturing power. Uh, what is it, 1906, when Air Crow <laughs> writes his famous memorandum saying, how in the world do we understand German policy? you know, flailing out all over the world in these strange ways. And we have, therefore, to respond to German capacity because we can't understand German intentions. That was a situation where fear did have a powerful effect. If China is, as I say, 30 years behind the U.S., even 10 years, 20 years behind the U.S., it's not like Britain and Germany in 1900 or 1914. The Americans don't have to respond with that sort of fearful response. So if hegemonic transition theory depends upon the rise in the power of X and the fear it creates in Y, then it's not clear to me that the rise in the power of China need create that Mearsheimer-like fear in the United States. Any case, so the hegemonic transition problem, I think, is one which has been overstated in terms of predicting conflict from the rise of China and the effects it will have on the U.S. But let me conclude this in the next uh, five minutes, because Mick said I shut, should shut up at 7.20, um, <laughs> by going back to the issue of hegemonic stability and the problem of public goods and the problems that are created by this second shift that I described, the vertical shift from state to non-state actors. And what we see there is that there's been an extraordinary information revolution. Not the first time the world's seen an information revolution. Gutenberg saw this earlier. But if you look at Moore's law, and the ability to double the number of transistors on a chip every 18 months or so, it's led to an extraordinary change in the reduction of the costs of computing power. So that in, let's say, 1970 to 2000, the last quarter or so of the 20th century, the cost of computing declined a thousandfold. That's very abstract, and I sometimes use an example to illustrate it. If the cost of an automobile had declined as rapidly as the cost of computing power, you'd buy an automobile today for about 15 pounds. Now, any time the price of something or the technology goes down that dramatically, the barriers to entry go down. 
So people who were priced out of the market in the 70s can now participate. So for example, in 1970, if you wanted to have the capacity to, uh, I don't know, make a phone call from uh, London to Beijing to Johannesburg to Brasilia and to Washington simultaneously, you could do it. Technologically, you could do it. It was very, very expensive. And so it was rationed by price to things like governments or multinational corporations. Today, any of you can do that for free on Skype. So a barrier to participation, which was once a major barrier, has fallen. Or to give you another example, in the 1970s, when I was working in the Carter administration, one of the great secrets that we had was that we could take a picture of any place on Earth with one meter resolution. And we spent billions of billions of dollars on that. Today, any of you can go on Google Earth and get a better picture for free. <laughs> so being priced out of the market doesn't mean the governments are suddenly obsolete. On the contrary, what it does mean is that there are many more actors able to crowd the stage. And non-state actors are now able to do things that were previously reserved just to governments. And that leads to a situation where there are a lot of new transnational problems, problems created by non-state actors which cross borders outside the control of governments. And those are issues where, in fact, you are going to need collective action to deal with these collective bads or, if you want, their alternative collective goods. I've sometimes used this, this metaphor of a three-dimensional chess board in which on the top board of military power, the world is still unipolar. There isn't any other power able to project military power globally. But on the middle board of economic relations among states, the world's multipolar and has been for a couple of decades. This is the field where when Europe acts as an entity, it's actually larger than the US. But on the bottom board of transnational relations, things that occur outside the control of governments, whether that be financial transactions that are larger than the budgets of some countries, or whether it be climate change, or whether it be pandemics, or whether it be terrorism, these types of problems, these transnational problems, are often generated by non-state actors. And states can only <coughs> deal with them by being able to have the capacity to organize collective activity. There's no way that any one state can deal with this alone, hegemon or not. So this is why we need to think about the second aspect that I described, Charlie Kindleberger's hegemonic stability theory. I'm less worried, as I suggested, about hegemonic transition leading to a battle between the US and China. There could be a battle between the US and China. People make miscalculations, mistakes. I mean, it's not totally out of the question. But that worries me less than the question of how we're dealing with the power shift to non-state actors and whether we're going to be able to organize to create the institutional structures, whether formal institutions or informal networks, to deal with the collective goods problems that are generated by this vertical shift in power. That to me is a, is a, uh, uh, a problem that actually worries me more than I'm worried by the traditional gilpin Mearsheimer power transition from side to side. So as we deal with, with, the, with the topic that, uh, that Mick assigned me, global power and shifting international order, I think we want to remember that power has a zero-sum dimension in which you act over others, power over, and that's still relevant. I mean, keeping a balance of power in the, let's say, the South China or East China Sea is, is still very important. That tends to be zero-sum. But there's also power with others as well as power over others, and that's where collective action comes in. Or another way of putting it, to go back to my original definition, if power is the ability to affect others to get the outcomes you want, and of many of the issues that we're dealing with, such as international financial stability, climate change, pandemics, transnational terrorism, are issues which we can't handle alone, 
then we can only succeed if others succeed as well. Only if we have power with others, not just power over others. And one of the great challenges to deal with the topic that we are thinking about um, of the shifts that are going on is are we ready to think clearly about this power with as well as power over, about the vertical responses to the vertical shift as well as the horizontal shift? Not too long ago, uh, the National Intelligence Council, which I once uh, headed, uh, issued a report on what they thought the world would look like in 2030. And what they said is that the U.S. is not going to recover the primacy or hegemony, if you wish to use that term, that it had in the 20th century. But it is going to be the leading state. It is going to be primus inter pares. What's different with the rise of the rest is we're going to have to pay more attention to the pares. And the U.S. is going to have to learn to work with others better than it does now if it's going to deal with things which matter very much to our citizens as well as to others in terms of being global public goods. So to me, the challenge that we face in answering this is how are we going to adjust our thinking about global power and a shifting international order in ways where we don't become trapped by traditional metaphors of decline or imperial overstretch or threats that uh, come out of China's rising power and so forth, and also are able to think about the question of will we be able to create the institutions, both formal and informal, to deal with the public goods problems that this vertical shift is creating for us. And that, to me, is really the heart of the question. So thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic and a fantastic conclusion to our day and a fantastic opening uh, to uh, what I think will be a, a great discussion. And I'm going to start it. Um, Joe, you're right. Uh, objectively, you're right. Your conclusions are solidly optimistic and liberal. Is that how policymakers in Washington and Beijing are thinking these days? That is, that is my worry. Uh, I, I share with you, I, I share much of your analysis, in fact, overwhelmingly most of it. Uh, and when, when we write our next book together, perhaps we could uh, do that together. Good. Uh, but um, I, it just worries me that whatever you say on the objective terms, the, the power, you know, it's not shifting in the ways of talking about China's much weaker than is made out to be, blah, blah, blah. Um, the United States should not be fearful and China should not be pushing hard. On the ground, it looks a bit more problematic. That's the way I see it. Now, is this misperception? Is it misunderstanding or whatever? The other thing is, every time I go to a conference now, John Mearsheim never looks so happy. <laughs> I mean, he, he keeps going around saying, I told you so. You know, because he was arguing this against Big Brzezinski a few years ago about the inevitable power transition conflict. So, I agree with your analysis. The question is, are the, is the leadership in Beijing listening to you or somebody else? And are the people in Washington actually beginning to think that there is a US decline and that China is rising and are responding to that? The tilt to Asia, the pivot to Asia is at least interpreted in some circles as being a response to what is perceived as China's rise and is setting off that security dilemma which you're trying to avoid. Let's start with that one and then open it up to okay. the rest of the audience. Yeah. Well, your, your points are very good ones, Mick, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, and that's why, as I said in this uh, new book, uh, just structural explanations aren't adequate. Yeah. Uh, human agency matters, and people who make the wrong decision or have misperceptions uh, or make miscalculations can throw off track things which structurally shouldn't happen. Um, Indeed, you could argue this is a, a, a counterfactual that uh, that uh, uh, World War uh, One uh, really is not just a structural question. It also involves a certain set of miscalculations that were made by leaders. I mean, the the uh, uh, 
basically, I think the Germans felt that uh, better to have the war before the railways were built that allowed the Russians to get their troops to the frontier. The Schlieffen plan would then be obsolete. Anyway, the point is people make calculations and miscalculations. So you could imagine, for example, in the East China Sea, um, a situation where a Chinese uh, uh, local ship captain uh, does something which isn't designed by people in Beijing, but faces, p pushes people in Beijing into a difficult situation of either backing down and losing face no. or taking a robust alternative. He's like, and that's not a facetious example. In 2010, you may remember there was a, uh, a Chinese fishing trawler which bashed into a Japanese Coast Guard ship. And uh, uh, it was not something on orders from Beijing. It turns out the fishing captain was drunk. But once it happened, it was impossible for leaders in Beijing to say, oh, forget it. And it wound up leading to the Chinese uh, embargoing the uh, export of rare minerals to Japan. And it turned Japanese opinion strongly anti-Chinese at a time when Japanese opinion was actually somewhat more ambivalent. There, there had been some efforts by some politicians in Japan to improve relations with China. So as one of my Japanese friends said, China's behavior in responding so strongly to this was an own goal. In other words, it, it really hurt China more than helped. But from the point of view of a Chinese leader saying, am I going to be criticized on the blogosphere and in the bureaucracy for being weak and giving in to Japanese? No. So you can get, I mean, I, I don't, I was not meaning by my description sure to give a, a Pollyanna view of the yeah, world. Yeah, sure. but, uh, and, and that's, again, the reason why in this new book I place so much emphasis on the interplay between structure and agency. What I'm saying is that structurally, I don't see the need for this. Mm. Therefore, if we can persuade people that that's the case, mm. that it's not like Britain in 1914 sure. or whatever, then maybe you won't have the misperceptions and the miscalculations. But history is full of surprises. Oh, sure. And uh, so I, I'm, it's, I'm not predicting, I'm describing no, 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 structural no. situations. Absolutely right. Okay, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, where's, the, where's the people with the, yeah, come on, let's get going here. <laughs> let's uh, we'll throw it into the middle here to, to Professor Danny Kwa. I want to bring, I'm only going to choose two people I know faster. And then I, I don't know, I know everybody in the audience. <laughs> Danny, we'll start with Professor Danny Kuo of the Department of Economics here. Um, Danny. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Nye, I'm intrigued by your uh, recasting of hegemonic stability theory in your description of a move from horizontal power shift to a vertical power shift. And part of the idea here, of course, is that by moving to the vertical power shift uh, dimension, we make much clearer what the global public goods are that the hegemon needs to strive for. But I wonder if the, one of the real problems with hegemonic stability theory as a way to understand IR is that those are actually relatively few and far between. Those problems where we can agree what the global public good is. It's true, nobody wants pandemics. It's true, we don't want more international terrorism. But in terms of something like international financial stability, where views differ sharply, on the moves that are needed to restore the world to international financial stability. Having a hegemon justify itself through hegemonic stability theory seems to me problematic. Okay. Well, I, th I think that's a very good point. And I also think that um, if you look at the response to the um, 2008 uh, financial crisis, which was largely made in America, in mean, American fault, what is interesting is that uh, the way in which the Obama administration replied was a way in which began to bring other states in. So uh, the use, the creation and use of the G24, but also the discussion of realignment of quotas in the IMF uh, are basically ways, I mean, the Americans learn slowly, but I would argue this is an example of, of their learning. John Eikenberry is here tonight and uh, has written about this very well, which, which is there's something about the 
openness of American hegemony, an openness in the sense of willingness to share power and others being, getting help some part of the, set some of the rules, that I think is encouraging. So, so I think your point, if, if the Americans use Kindleberger's theory in a simplistic way and say, we're Britain and we're doing it all ourselves, then I think I would not be very optimistic. But the idea that the Americans can learn to share more power, not totally, I mean, there are lots of limits on the way they do things, I think is a source for some optimism. Um, so I, I, but I think your point is, is well taken. Okay, there's a man in black. Straight up. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the Could very you bring the mic down to lecture. here, please? Yeah. There's a lady. Carry on, yeah. I, I was just going to ask what do you think that in a, in a shifting international order, the domestic structure of the West and the rest might make a difference to their soft power capabilities? As we've seen recently, there's, there's been a well publicized hunger strike in Guantanamo Bay, where over 100 people are, are going on the hunger strike. But if, if 100 Chinese prisoners go on hunger strike in the middle of the forest, do they make a sound? And uh, obviously there are restrictions on budgeting. If, if the relative balance is changing and the West must, must publish a budget under perhaps more scrutiny than the rest, will that potentially affect soft power capabilities? And uh, also, if I, I can, another question. Uh, China's had quite a lot of soft power success in, in West Africa especially and other parts of the developing world. So do you think that the West still has a chance to keep any soft power it might have? Okay, great. Sure. On, the, on uh, the soft power of the US, I think it's, it's damaged by um, Guantanamo. So I, I, I mean, I think there are things, I mean, and if you actually if you look at the uh, uh, before that, the invasion of, of Iraq, uh, you can measure it. I mean, attractiveness of the United States drops by about 30 points per country in all Western European countries. And it dropped by even more than that in Muslim countries. So you can see actions which the Americans take which reduce American soft power. But at the same time, a lot of American soft power comes from non-state actors, from civil society. So the fact that uh, people could be uh, protesting uh, American policies but still wanting to go to American universities is something that, that which uh, indicates the, the, uh, the diverse nature of the sources of American soft power. I think the, for the Chinese, um, they're, the, the, they haven't got to that point with uh, unleashing civil society. So Chinese get a certain amount of soft power from the success of their economy. It's a, it's a model which attracts others, and that's your West African case. Uh, they also get uh, a certain amount of soft power from their culture. It is a very Chinese traditional culture, it's very attractive, so these Confucius Institutes uh, are able to create attraction. But um, you know, when, they, when you lock up uh, Ai Weiwei, or Liu Xiaobo, you're, you're just not going to compete in Paris or London. You may not do too badly in Lagos or Dakar, I don't know. Uh, but in terms of, of the countries which probably are most important in terms of, of power, um, I think the Chinese are going to, I mean, they may have a certain uh, degree of soft power uh, that uh, uh, is, is important, I'm not belittling it, but it's not clear that it's going to be greater than American or British soft power when you, when you put it on the larger scale. So I actually don't worry all that much about Chinese activities in Africa. I mean, it, it, to me, Africans can take care of their own thinking, and I, don't, I think the fact that, uh, that there's an attraction to the Chinese situation at times uh, uh, abetted by Chinese aid, uh, you know, that's, that yeah. to me is not a great worry. That, that won't be a permanent factor. So I, I, I think there's a, I think the Americans ought to be more careful about how they shepherd their soft power, and Guantanamo's a good case. But uh, are we going to lose a soft power battle with China uh, in Africa or elsewhere? Um, I don't think so. 
Okay, I'm going to take two or three here. There's uh, a lady up there, and there's somebody here, yeah, and there's somebody in green. So I'm going to take three here, Joe. Make them short and snappy, if you don't mind. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Professor Nye. So you touched very briefly on the role of digital diplomacy or of this online space, which a lot of people are saying is an extension of a public sphere. For the very reasons you said, it's reduced uh, uh, cost to entry and a lot of people can do it. But at the same time, you mentioned that generating broadcast by the government doesn't bring you credibility. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on all these digital diplomacy efforts, for instance, by the UK, by the US, by, by non-state actors. And at the same token, when you have media organizations, for instance, like Al Jazeera, who are also taking advantage of the online and the media space in order to project their own variations of soft power. Great, thanks, nice and short. And there's somebody here, yeah, please, sir. Yes. That's great, no, good question. Good. Nice sure. yeah. I want as many people to come in as possible, that's why. Okay, thank you very much for the interesting talk. My name is Zhen Bohou from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, my question is kind of similar to Professor Kwa's, and it is about uh, global public goods. And if the legitimacy of being a hegemon is about one's uh, ability and willingness to provide sustainable global public goods to the rest of the world. How do you think the formation of the BRIC economies uh, is going to make a contribution to that, especially in the economic domain? Thank you. Thank you very much. Public goods and BRICs and in green. Hi, Please. my name is Sarah. Just a quick question on uh, the importance of demo democracy and creating soft power, or at least uh, strengthening one soft power. I'm wondering whether the China's, uh, Chinese administration's ultimate sacrifice will be a transition to democracy before China can really exert any kind of considerable amount of soft power in the world. Great. Sure, that was you. Uh, well, on the first question on the um, uh, changes in technology and uh, communication, the, the existence of the internet, the blogosphere, the Twitter sphere, and so forth, uh, makes things much more complicated. And, and it's very interesting. If you're trying to do public diplomacy as a government, um, and you're doing it just by broadcasting, the great danger is that in an information age where there's such a plethora of sources of information, the scarce resource is attention. And attention goes to credibility. And government broadcasting is not always very credible. A rare exception to this, I think, uh, is the BBC. And one of the reasons the BBC maintains credibility is because it is able to bite the hand that feeds it. In other words, being self-critical is of your country is a way of maintaining credibility. So it's not that government broadcasting can't generate any soft power. I think Britain proves that you can. But if you ask with China's efforts, uh, but I'm using China as an example, but I don't, I mean, you could make it for other countries as well. Um, if you take these vast expenditures in CCTV becoming a, uh, a, a CNN, or you take, if you take, for that matter, uh, Gutter in Al Jazeera, uh, if it's regarded as the master's voice, then it doesn't have credibility, mm -hmm. and then it doesn't generate soft power. So if you're doing clever public diplomacy nowadays, you really want to figure out how do you use the Twitter sphere and the blogosphere to get lots of voices from citizens to citizens. The trouble with that is it's very awkward for ministers to stand up in parliament and say, wait a minute, you're saying a foreign service officer of the Her Majesty's government criticized Guantanamo, uh, you know, publicly on the Twitter sphere? And, but if you don't allow that, you don't get the credibility. So the, so the problem of how do you organize public diplomacy uh, nowadays, uh, it's got to go beyond broadcasting. But once you let it go beyond broadcasting, you have all the problems of democratic accountability. And uh, it's not an easy problem. Now, on the question of global public goods, and can the BRICS contribute to global public goods, um, well, again, I don't like the term BRICS. Can China contribute to global public goods? Yes. Uh, can India? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Um, 
And, and I suppose Russia could if it, if it, if, if it wanted to devote the resources to it. But um, the, as an entity, uh, the BRICS announced an investment bank to be a rival to, uh, or a development bank to be a rival to, uh, I guess, the World Bank. But it, it doesn't seem to have taken off. Uh, and so in principle, I suppose you could say that the BRICS as an organization could contribute to global public goods. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. On the question of democracy and China, if China became democratic, then the constraint that I saw or described on Chinese soft power would presumably go away. If it were democratic, it would unleash its civil society. And an unleashed Chinese civil society would be like an unleashed British, French, US, German civil society. It would be some good things and some bad things. I mean, if you think of American civil society, there's some aspects which are attractive, there's some which are unattractive about American culture. But China would then be like others, and it wouldn't have the problem that I described, which is the fact that it can't, uh, it can't let go. You know, there's, I, I was giving a speech in uh, Shanghai, and a student uh, stood up at Fudan University and said, um, how do we increase Chinese soft power? And I said, relax. <laughs> <laughs> Not very helpful. <laughs> Not yeah. very helpful. What, what did he say in reply, Jim? <laughs> he was quiet. He was quiet, yeah, yeah. I wonder why. Uh, there's a question at the back there, um, and there's a question at the front here, and I'll come up to the balcony in a moment. Yeah, at the back, of the front, take two together, and I'll pick up some more. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I had a question about uh, picking up on uh, Professor Cox's uh, question, actually, around uh, whether the human agency will, will kind of comply with the relatively positive vision you put forward. And it was really around, I mean, it seems to me that the U.S. are pursuing the only credible strategy um, in relation to China and engaging and hedging at the same time. But getting the balance right is clearly the trick. And what I haven't seen is an articulation of what a peaceful accommodation of China as a regional power in the Asia Pacific actually looks like. What compromises are going to be required on either side? And will si both sides be willing to make them? Do you have a view on what that might look like? Okay, compromises in the region. A bit short on the ground at the moment. Yeah, one at the front. Thanks. Please. Um, um, hi, Professor Nye. Uh, my name is Fareed Shamshuddin. I used to be a student here at the LSE. In fact, Professor Cox was a lecturer of mine. Well done. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Like you. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> um, I want to just take it away from China for a, for a second mm -hmm. and um, actually pick up on your point about uh, non-state actors you mentioned now sharing the stage with states and take the specific example perhaps or a growing trend, uh, particularly in, in uh, the, the MENA region, uh, whereby you have uh, non-state actors who actually have now transited and have become state actors. So whereby um, uh, a lot of the US's interlocutors in the post-Arab Revolution countries were previously oppressed by the very regimes that the US for many decades purposefully kept in power and how you felt uh, that you know, those particular cases might play out, specifically with, perhaps with, with reference to uh, the US encouraging uh, these uh, nascent states to understand representative government in the way that the US, Europe, um, and most of the West understand um, and call liberal democracy, really. Do you want to take those two, Joe? Okay. Yep. On, the, on the first one, how could you imagine accommodation with China, um, there is a certain amount of accommodation occurring already. I mean, the Americans complain bitterly about China's undervalued currency. And uh, uh, basically, if you look at the situation, about 90% of that problem is solved. Now you can get quibbles from economists. I mean, solved partly by some adjustments in the exchange rate, partly by inflation, partly by uh, uh, some accommodation. But certainly the US and China have had a strategic economic dialogue, which goes back several years. And in that process, uh, you know, you don't at the end of it say, gee, we just agreed on everything. That's rare in the press conference. But if you look at the, the net question of whether China's exchange rate is so severely undervalued that it's damaging US industry, I don't know, colleagues of mine tell me who are economists, so I'm they're better able to judge than I, Tell me about 80, 90% of the problem has been solved over the last few years. 
So there's an example of accommodation. Uh, but an, an, an area where I think we should put more effort is energy and climate. Um, China builds one new coal-fired plant every week. That CO2 is a collective bad, the global public bad. And if we could help China develop its shale gas capacities by helping with easing uh, any restrictions on the export of the technologies related to hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, um, you could cut China's admission omissions, uh, sorry, emissions in half without cutting their growth rate. In other words, you, don't, you, 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 can, you can imagine this is a case where as China gets better at this and we get better at it, we're both better off. Um, so I, I think energy and climate would be a, an area where I would place a fair amount of emphasis on, on another area of accommodation. On the question of non-state actors in the Middle East, it's interesting if you look at the experience of Tahrir Square um, in what was called the Arab Spring uh, two years ago, uh, you had a generation of people who were empowered by new technology to overcome collective action problems. They could actually communicate with each other, get together, and as we saw, they produced a situation where uh, the Mubarak regime uh, had to respond and eventually left office. Um, as it turned out, they didn't have the capacity through Facebook or Twitter or whatever to organize political parties that could win in elections. So if you ask, did it produce democracy, uh, it produced something different from what was there before, but I think it's, the jury is still out as to what will happen in terms of democracy. Um, but is the, if you ask how should the U.S. or how did the U.S. respond to it, uh, what's interesting to me is that Obama took a bet, and when he was communicating with Mubarak, he bet on the Tahrir Square generation. And some people said, big mistake. For example, the Saudis said, this is a terrible thing to do. And Obama basically made a bet that history over the longer term was going to be on the side of the Tower Square generation. We don't know whether he met the right bet or not. I mean, it's too soon to, to tell. Mm. But it is interesting that rather than following the traditional policies that, as you describe them, of siding with the stable autocrat because you know the stable autocrat, uh, he took a different bet. And uh, I hope it turns out right. I think I got two up in the balcony. Who's, the, who's got the first one? One there and one there. And then there's a, a lady in the middle here. So I just take those three. That may bring us to the end. I do apologize. I've been trying to bring as many people in as possible. So, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Nye. Um, just a quick question. Russia, bringing the theme to Russia. Yeah. In the context of global power shift, uh, where do you see Russia? How can it use its soft power wisely? And what can Russia do to achieve a positive image? Yeah, okay. Right. There should be a short answer to that one. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm so biased. I'm terrible. Uh, gentleman there, please. Yeah, um, say in the middle. So yeah, I'd, I'd like um, to go back to China, and I'd like to know if you um, say that one shouldn't take the hegemonic transition theory too seriously on the grounds that China still has a long way to go to match the United States in terms of its capabilities. Um, how do you explain China's um, so-called new assertiveness after 2008? I mean, how do you explain the fact, or how, how would you explain China's intentions um, when it comes to the uh, Senkaku Islands, for instance? Thank you. Okay, and this will have to be the last question for the evening. Anyway, yeah, please, yeah. Uh, my question is about local elected officials on the global stage. I think we see more of them because it's easier to get on the global stage. Do you consider local elected officials on the global stage to be non-state actors or state actors? And then what are the implications for state sovereignty and the balance of power? Right. I think that will take us to the Okay. Yep. Um, on, the, uh, on Russia, uh, I think the, after the elections in Russia and 
Vladimir Putin won the elections, but he basically lost in the streets. There was a, a generation that was protesting against him. And he turned to um, basically nationalism to generate domestic political support and to delegitimize the protesters. And I think that's been very dam damaging for Russian soft power. I mean, locking up these young women, uh, Pussy Riot, who did the song in the cathedral, uh, putting uh, people on trial for protests and so forth, this has hurt Russian soft power. And I think it's too bad. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. um, if Russia wanted to increase its soft power, think of the, the glories of traditional Russian culture, music, literature, paintings. I mean, there's so many things that are attractive about Russia that it's a pity to see that uh, uh, appealing to nationalistic and xenophobic uh, ways to maintain your domestic political support has occurred like this. I wrote a piece about uh, in foreign policy blog uh, about, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago, called Why China and Russia Don't Get Soft Power. And so some of my thoughts are explained at greater length there. But I'd like to see Russia change its policy because I think it has many admirable, character admirable characteristics. On China and new assertiveness, I think what happened after the year 2008, China grew at 10% a year. The U.S. was in a severe recession. And there are a lot of Chinese who thought that this proved that the U.S. was in decline and China was rising. And I think the new assertiveness was a miscalculation. Uh, and the, I think it turned out to be quite expensive to China. In fact, if you look at China's relations with Japan, Korea, India, and by Korea I mean South Korea, India, <coughs> Vietnam, and several other countries, they were much worse after this new assertiveness. So it, it was an expensive bet for China that the U.S. was in decline and it was on the rise. And the Chinese began to realize, the top leaders began to realize this by, by about the end of 2011. Dai Bing Guo, the state counselor, writes a, uh, an essay saying maybe we should go back to Deng Xiaoping's advice of take your time. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I think that in the, before they got back to that position, they had done themselves considerable damage. Um, if you take the last question about uh, local elected officials, um, in a sense they are state actors, but they can also uh, play a very important transnational role. I guess it was in the 1970s that Bob Cohen and I coined this phrase, transgovernmental relations, <coughs> the way parts of governments, not necessarily the top level of governments, but lower bureaucracies, lower elected officials, can form coalitions across state boundaries and can affect the relations among states. So in the sense that when you have, let's say, uh, local government officials who go to conferences, have different ways of communicating with each other, on the blogosphere, whatever, they become what we call transgovernmental actors and transgovernment coalitions. And I think many uh, of the problems that we face in the terms of these uh, problems created by the information revolution, the, the, what I call the vertical power shift, uh, are going to require both transnational and transgovernmental coalitions to try to produce the networks that will be useful in solving them. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, my, my apologies because I know a number of hands have gone up and I couldn't bring everybody in, so I tried to bring as many in, but I do apologize. It's always, good, it's always a good idea, I think, to always finish on a high note with lots of hands going up, but none at all. Uh, this has been a great day for us in ideas. It's been a great day discussing the United States. Craig Calhoun, our new director, said this morning, we've got to take the United States even more seriously than we've been doing at the school. And I think this is at least one of the contributions. Uh, so... Thank you for your many good questions, but more importantly, thank you for Joe Knight. Joe is doing many things, but the one thing he's not doing at the moment, you may have noticed, is declining. So to, can we put our hands together for a non-declining Joe Knight?